and uh, it was a pretty grim scene. I was sitting in a lesson. I was a, an English teacher covering someone else's lesson, and this this I picked up a history book, and the the, the scene was about Augustus Caesar carrying the heads. I did say it was grim of Julius Caesar's assassins um, to the foot of Julius Caesar's statue in Rome, and I was thinking that there were twenty three assassins, and that the head is the largest, single, heaviest part of the human body and carrying 23 of them isn't possible in one go even if you arrange them in a pyramid of some sort so I was assuming he did it in relays or, or, or had friends with him I, said, I know you weren't expecting this to just go to go straight to this but the point is I wanted to know about the relationship um what would make one man want to do that just to put to take the people who killed his his great uncle and friend and mentor and say I've done it I've I've revenged I've avenged you um, and that was an interesting relationship. And I, I started to look into the story and I found that Julius Caesar you know, had a young life that most people didn't know. They all know the Titanic sank and they all know he was, you know, that Brutus was involved in his assassination and so on. But they don't know that he was captured by pirates at the age of 19 and, and held for ransom. And, uh, you know, he was in prison waiting for the ransom to be paid for some months. And in those months, he sang to his captors and he recited stories and poetry to them. But all the time, he said, of course, you know, one day I will get out and when I am released, I will come back and I will find you and I will have you all executed. Um, I may have your officers strangled out of a sense of mercy, which was a decent thing to sort of promise in those days. And uh, sure enough, when the, the ransom was paid, they dropped him on the north coast of Africa. We don't know exactly how he did this next part because it's a big gap in the record, but where they dropped him to the nearest Roman town is about 150 miles. And he, when he appeared in the next Roman town, he had managed to gather a crew of young people with him, young men. He must have gone from village to village. And it's a mystery how he did it. I can only assume that the Roman army used to retire people in that part of North Africa. And it's just possible that the sons of those retired legionaries were waiting for something exciting to happen. And if a young man like Julius Caesar came into their village and said, would you like to follow me? I've got some interesting things to do. Then they might just have done. Well, they did. I mean, he had a group of them and he managed to collect enough money to to hire a ship and they went out onto the Mediterranean and crisscrossed it until they found the group of pirates that had held him for ransom and boarded and took the ship and he had the men, it's a bit dark again, but he had the men crucified up and down that piece of coast and had the officers strangled exactly as he said because he was 19 years old but he was a man of his word and I'm reading this and thinking people don't know this, this isn't common knowledge, this is the, the greatest adventure story that I've ever come across and it's not well known. So I started writing. It took me two years and I sent it into a publisher at the end. And I said to my wife, you know, I've been doing this since the age of 11. If this doesn't go, I think it's the best I can do. And if this doesn't go, then I'm done. I can't, uh, I can't do any better than this. So I am finished and I will concentrate on being a teacher. My father was a teacher. My mother was a teacher. Teachers tend to breed teachers. They meet each other in staff rooms and they have teacher children. And I was one of them. And, um, so, and then it, amazingly, it was accepted. Um, after me writing it for two years, it was the first book to be accepted and, and the door opened for the very first time. And that was, that was 21, 22 years ago now. And the doors never closed. Uh, you know, in theory, the idea was to take a year off and write the sequel. And I'm still taking my year off, but it's 22 years later. That's how, that's how I got started. Um, since then, I've written uh, books on Genghis Khan um, which was a tough sell to the publishers because, believe it or not, he is a wonderfully warm, was a wonderfully warm family man, beloved by his sons and grandsons and his his brothers in particular. And his he rescued his wife and his wife was kidnapped and all the rest of it. But he's only known for being the most ruthless man alive, which makes an interesting uh, contrast when you're writing about someone. Um, I mean, he and Kublai Khan, his grandson, the arc of the story there was that Genghis Khan was abandoned at the age of about 11 with his wife, his mother and six other children, including one who's a babe in arms. And they were abandoned and left to die and starved to death on the plains of Mongolia. And they are fairly hostile, empty plains. I once drove at about an average speed of 50 miles an hour for eight hours uh, across a, a valley. And at the end of that time, I was in the same valley. I couldn't quite believe it. The sheer scale of the place is millions of square miles of sheer emptiness. Um, incredibly beautiful country and a fairly hostile place to to spend winter as it goes down to minus 40 degrees and all the rest of it it's 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 
incredibly grim, but do, Genghis Khan going from that position of one of his brothers stole food and the other brothers killed that brother because he was dooming them all to starvation. To go from that level of closeness to death to his grandson Kubla Khan being the richest and most powerful man on earth is a heck of a story arc. And that's, you know, again, the, the thing I was looking for is the extraordinary thing you can do with a life and, and, and an extraordinary story. I won't go through every aspect of my entire career. I'll just say the, the um, I, did, I did the dangerous book for boys as a hobby. Um, I didn't think it would be successful. I didn't expect anyone to be interested in this. My dad was born in 1923 and his father was born in 1850. So he had my father when he was 73. And that mean, means that he was brought up by a proper Victorian with big whiskers and, and all the rest of it. And it meant that I grew up with books like 101 Chemical Amusements for Boys and things. And I thought this was perfectly normal where it would say, you know, go and get a shilling's worth of magnesium from the apothecary or whatever it was. <laughs> so I just tried to write a book that I thought would be fun um, for boys to read. And I, because when I had sons of my own, I couldn't find that sort of book. Um, and I, I said to my agent, do you, you know, do you think it's going to sell any? And she said, Con, I think it's our pension, which was, you know, it was nice for her. Um, it did go on to, to sell a lot of books. It was book of the year and all sorts of strange things. That was an enormous pleasure. I probably shouldn't tell you actually, but I, I'll just tell you very quickly. It was, <laughs> it was, it was, it was, hang on, I am being recorded. Oh, what the heck? <laughs> I, it was with, oh, I see, this is tricky. No, no, no. <laughs> see, I can be a bit it's gossipy a sometimes. I, it was, oh. all right. I'll, no, I'll, I'll just tell you. It's been, it's been a lot of years. You know, I should be able to say this sort of thing. <laughs> I, was, um, I was with Bloomsbury when it first, because we picked Bloomsbury because my agent said she thought it was a, a good fit for the book. And when I wrote the book and handed it in, they said, we like it, but there are seven chapters we'd like you to cut. And one of them was hunting and shooting a rabbit uh, with an air rifle. And th that was to give you the flavor of why they said you shouldn't put these things in. They said, if you do this, you will, it will be controversial and you'll get in trouble and you'll get us in trouble and all sorts of things. And they said, if you cut those seven chapters, I'll use the word they use, they said, you'll sell shed loads. If you don't, and we understand it's your book, you don't have to, we can't force you to, we'll price it at, I forgot what they said, 25 or 30 pounds. We won't discount it, we'll do a limited print run, and, we'll, and they didn't say this, but we'll pretty much kill it stone dead. And that, that was the, the sort of offer. And I was stuck at the time because, I mean, I, I like to sell shed loads, but I have also written a book which I really liked and didn't want to muck about with at all. And um, two things happened. I, I, I called my brother because I've been writing it with him and uh, because, you know, someone needed to make the tea. And the thing is, I said, I know I'm being recorded, so in, you know, I hope that would make him laugh. But the point is, he said, I said, look, here are the two options. And he said, Con, I don't care if we only get the thing you told me that we'd get promotional copies to go on our shelves. I just would like it to be the book that we wrote in the six months in a shed. And, and that's all I really care about. So I don't, you know, let's, and I said, well, all right, but okay, good. And he, in that way, he justified, by the way, him being part of the project completely because it, it turned out to be the right decision. But I said to him, how can I go back to the publishers and say, you know, that nuclear option where you said, if you keep the chapters, you're going to make life very difficult. I'd like to go for that, please. I mean, that just doesn't, it just doesn't work. It's an absolute disaster. And I didn't know what to do, but I had met Bernard Cornwall, the historical fiction writer. And I'd met him a couple of times. And obviously he's vastly more experienced than, than me in this area, in any area. And so I emailed him. I said, look, what am I going to do? I've got this impossible situation. I can't choose between them. And he said, well, put it on a, a moped, the manuscript, which is obviously finished, and send it to Susan Watt, my editor across London, and uh, see what she thinks. And she read the, the book and said, oh, I'll, I'll take it on. So that was Harper Collins, and they bought out Bloomsbury. So they paid off all of their expenses, which was things like the illustrator who had already, you know, done most of the illustrations and that was a whole mess. I mean, it was a really messy, difficult, unpleasant sort of a thing. But the, the book, you know, went on to sell better than any of my others. And it was, the, it was the right thing to do. And we kept the chapters. That was the point. We kept the, uh, the chapters that I wanted to, to keep. So that was a nice thing. And I probably shouldn't tell that story. I'm sorry. Because, <laughs> like, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's internal gossip. However, um, <laughs> it's done now. it is done now, exactly. Um, so from that point, uh, I mean, I went on to a series on Wars of the Roses. I looked for stories. Um, you know, I, I was interested in the idea 
of King Henry VI and the fact that he had an extraordinary period of about 18 months where he was effectively in a coma. Um, it wasn't a coma because he was, he couldn't feel, he could feel pain, but he wouldn't react. He was shown his baby son that he'd managed to father at the beginning and didn't react to it, but he was sort of, his eyes were open. He was conscious. I mean, this is why one of the reasons he prayed eight hours a day, he slept um, eight hours a day. There's, um, I mean, you know, goodness, that leaves hardly any time to do anything anyway, but he uh, was almost made a saint um, because of his extreme humility and piety, but he was also famously at the time a biddable man if you could get to him and say your majesty i would like a castle then he would give you the castle if it was in his power and that made him extremely dangerous because it meant that anyone who could physically get into his presence could bend him to their will and that meant um well that's effectively the cause of the wars of the roses that he was a vacuum of power and into that vacuum stepped people like the the duke of york um, who was, you know, a, an opportunist, but who can blame him in the circumstances when Henry VI, and only the fact that Henry VI was married to an extraordinary woman, Margaret of Anjou, um, protected and saved him uh, from an early death. I mean, he almost died at the very beginning in St. Albans. Um, the very first battle um, was uh, involved a charge up a hill and breaking through defences, and King Henry VI was at the top, and he was hit by an arrow, they say in the neck, but if it had been in the neck, he would have died. So it has to be somewhere around the clavicle, some, some sort of wound neckish that wouldn't kill you. And he was taken into St. Albans, and it wasn't a cathedral then, it was the uh, place, monastery. It was a monastery. And it had even then one of the longest naves um, in England. And he was taken down to the altar where he uh, lay bleeding while the Duke of York mopped up outside and came in as the victor of that battle. And the Duke of York, as he walked down that very long nave, we tend to forget the churches were not pale and pallid in those days because they were painted in very, very bright colours, um, which has all gone away now so that you're left with very pale white stone. But in those days, he would have seen scenes from heaven and hell and colours, blue, reds, golds all over the place. It would, it would have been a blaze of colour not available to anyone in their private homes. Churches were vivid uh, painted places and as he walked down through those scenes and through those colors towards a bleeding potentially dying king at the end he had to choose whether to make an ending right then and there and because he would have believed that Henry was appointed by God and he was standing on sacred ground and so on he didn't and because he didn't make an ending quickly at that time tens of thousands would die um, in the years that followed and one of the bloodiest sort of periods of English history you know, took place over the next 30 years. And it's all really because of that first moment in St. Albans. It should have started and finished on the same day. And again, that's a heck of a story. And I, I've been to Towton, um, where I think, how was it, 50,000 people died on a single day? I mean, it was, and of course, it's hand-to-hand -hand fighting. It was absolutely brutal. Um, we lost more people at the Battle of the Somme, but then that involved machine guns and, and rifles. And like this, this tended to be axes and swords and hammers. It was a very, very nasty business. And I, I've seen where the ground suddenly drops away because I was reading descriptions of people in armor tumbling. And once they started tumbling, they roll right down and drown in, in the stream at the bottom. And it only made sense when I saw the sheer steepness of the ground. If you're wearing armor and you start to go on that, it, you'd go right down to the bottom. It's one of the reasons that I like to visit places if I possibly can to get that sense of, of reality. Um, oh, I'm from Telton. Or yes, the village next door to town. It's yeah. it's an eerie place. I don't think that's too much of an you know too much of the wrong word. It's uh, I mean knowing that so many people that the ground was drenched in blood, and knowing that so many lives were lost there in horror and pain and all the rest of it, it was an eerie place to walk. It was a it's a tiny hamlet and a very peculiar little community. That, um, I um. One of the other places near, not too far away, but uh, was uh, Wakefield, the Sandal Castle. And there was a bit I was trying to ex explain to myself how it was possible that uh, it was um, uh, York and uh, Salisbury. And they, they took an army north, realized they were outmatched about two to one and hid for the evening in Sandal Castle, which I assumed was an enormous great place like Pembroke or, or something like that. But it isn't. It's a tiny little fortress. And then... <clears throat> They were spotted and the army came through the woods and the Queen's army, Margaret of Anjou, uh, the, the Lancaster side came through the woods to them. And then they attempted to sally out and were overwhelmed. They couldn't get out fast enough. And it was only when I got there and saw that the, the gate over the moat was about six feet wide. 
they just physically couldn't get out in time. They could only put two horsemen or, or three or four men. And so therefore they came out and were pretty much just, you know, cut to pieces. Um, a, a something, a reality that I only knew and understood when I had been there and stood in that place. It's uh, something I try and do with all of these books because there will always be gaps. Um, you know, I, I haven't killed anyone. So it is important, um, for example, even something trivial like the fact that my brother once stabbed me in the foot because we were trying to do that mumblety peg thing um but with a foot <laughs> and a bayonet uh hit me and went straight through my shoe and into the ground and uh there was and you know, even the the way the blood cove covered my hands and, and it's incredibly sticky if you've got any experience of blood there's the stuff's like sugar it's ridiculous um even little details like that i try and uh, remember uh, because I will use them and every location I will use. I went to Mongolia for Genghis Khan because I, I realized I couldn't see it in my mind. I couldn't see the colors. Um, I, I now know it looks exactly like the Brecon Beacons, but I didn't know that at the time. I could have saved myself a small fortune, frankly, um, and saddle saws and everything else had I known, but I didn't know. And in all honesty, there were things I saw there that I couldn't uh, have guessed it. The, the pony I was riding, which was very small. It was almost embarrassing for someone of my size to be. I was slightly lighter then, but nonetheless, when it was tired, having carried me for 20 miles, um, it would lie down and go to sleep and it would curl in its legs like a big dog and would lie on its side with its head and, and legs curled in. And I thought, I, I didn't know a lot about horses and I thought horses had to sleep standing up or they got colic or that's, that was something I believed to be true. But it's not true about ponies because they're they're like enormous St. Bernard dogs, you know, it's that sort of size. They can, um, they can lie down. I wouldn't have discovered that if I hadn't gone. Um, I was also in the middle of nowhere. Almost all my Mongolian stories start like that. And I saw a totem pole in a village with carved heads. I said to, I had a guide with me and I said, well, what the hell? You know, what, why is there a totem pole? I mean, I've seen that in cartoons and the like. I don't see why there's one in the middle of a Mongolian village mm -hmm. with hundreds of miles of empty ground nearby. And uh, she said, um, well, you know, about 15,000 years ago, we crossed the, uh, we went north into, um, you know, uh, up into the Arctic and, and we crossed the Bering Strait where it was freezes. You can walk across it. And we went into Canada and um, down into, America and you know we and I said no I actually I don't know this I've never heard of this I, I was unaware that there was any link between Mongolian people and the Native Americans the Inuit you name it and but th at that time they hadn't done DNA testing but uh, uh, to, to compare the two groups but actually they are the ancestors of the Sioux the um, the Inuit, you name it, they're the sort of distant proto-ancestors who crossed the Bering Strait and came down into America, which was fascinating. And I would never have found that out. Of course, as soon as I realized that, I thought, well, they've got jet black hair and, and reddish skin. They're short and very wide set, partly through wrestling all the time. But I mean, they're short and physically powerful. They love the, ho the horse. They're great with the bow. I mean, Genghis Khan's warriors were, you know, um, the Sioux. And, and that's a fascinating sort of uh, comparison and one that I never would have found unless I'd actually gone there. Um, God, I wasn't expecting to do any of this. I've got to say, this is all, <laughs> I've got a complete thing. I'll t I'll actually, I should start now. I sort of said, this is what I was intending to do as a start because I've moved on to uh, ancient Greece at the moment. I, I am going to ask you for questions. <laughs> this is the plan. The plan was to, to speak for a few minutes. And by that point, you would have thought of a question. And then I take whichever way you wanted it you know, to, to go. But I've just rattled on now for goodness. Oh, my Lord. 15 minutes. OK, well, I will say um, I avoided ancient Greece for a long time because uh, I don't know if you know David Gemmell's books at all, but I love them. And he did a fantastic um, double book. It's a sort of heroic fantasy. And he did one called Lion of Macedon as the first book and Dark Prince, I think was the second. And I, I thought that is such a, there were, there's magic involved and fantasy. And that was sort of, that takes a lot of readers out because they, they won't read something that takes, has a fantasy element, but I don't mind that and I loved it. And I thought the, the historical fiction aspect, which was about the young life of Alexander the Great, it was just, it was wonderful. I thought I can't do better than this. So I can never touch Alexander the Great because you know, I can't, I, I, if I can't have a stab at doing it better, if I'm constantly thinking about the choices Gemmell made and thinking I can't make the best choice, so I've got to make the second best choice every time to, to remain original in my approach, it's going to be an absolute disaster. So I avoided that and therefore I avoided ancient Greece for a long time until um, 
I came across the story of uh, Xenophon and the 10,000, which used to be a, uh, a very, very well-known story. It was taught regularly in schools and it's just fallen away. It's an example of, it used to be sort of considered one of the great adventure stories of all time. 401 BC, a Persian prince um, comes to Greece after the Peloponnesian Wars in Athen Athens and, and Sparta, and he hires 10,000 Greek mercenaries, Spartans and Athenians mainly, to come and take the throne from his brother. And to cut a long story uh, shorter, they march hundreds and hundreds of miles into the east um, along the roads that the, uh, the Persian um, postal, the, the couriers used to run. They have that same motto, I wrote it down. Um, neither snow nor rain nor heat nor gloom of night stays these couriers from the swift completion of their appointed rounds, which is currently the motto of the US Postal Service, but it is a translation of Herodotus describing the motto of the Persian cour couriers along that road. They marched along that road, and I won't give the whole story away, but it turned into a complete disaster for the, uh, the Greeks. They found themselves alone and literally surrounded by half a million uh, Persian soldiers and the only that with a huge advantage militarily they discovered they could move through the army almost at will but they had to get home and it is the, the original story is called anabasis which is i think the way up or the way home and it's ten thousand people trying to survive in hostile uh, lands and getting all the way back to where they finally find a, a shore and they shout oh god is it thalata thalata the the sea the sea when they finally see a, a piece of coast that they know it's a it's a hell of a story and i had the absolute delight of reading about spartans and athenians and i slightly sort of thought this is wonderful they, they kept arguing all the time the persians would say something like we'd like you to come to a, 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 a truce um discussion so lay down your weapons and come along and they would say hold on now and then they would say so if we put down our weapons, we'll be less use. If they want us to be allies, we should be armed because without weapons, we'll be less useful as allies. And if they're not our friends and we're not to be allies, then we definitely want to keep our weapons with us. So there is no possible way we're going to put down the weapons. And they would argue this for an hour and it would be all the different people. And then Simonia Sophia stood up and he gave it, and then his argument would be laid out. And I, I thought this is wonderful. The idea in hostile countries, sur literally surrounded by the enemy, having a long winded discussion as to what exactly they should do was just, it was just brilliant. And uh, I love the fact that, uh, a little bit like Napoleon saying, um, oh God, every one of his soldiers carries a, a, a general's epaulets in his something along the, it, you could be promoted. When all their officers are killed, one man steps up and says, I think I know what to do. And that was Xenophon who went on to write the story of the 10,000 and his part in it. So it's a sort of eyewitness tale of uh, a survival against the odds in extremely hostile country and having to fight their way across strange mountains with people leaping from, you know, it's just, it, honestly, it's a heck of a story. So I thought, well, okay, if I can't touch Alexander the Great still, I can maybe look for stories in ancient Greece. And then I found, of course, the, the sort of most famous sequence of stories overall, which is, you know, 490 BC, um, <coughs> the Persians invade for the first time under King Darius and a group um, march out, no more than I think it was five or 6,000, marched out from uh, Athens alone, because Sparta wasn't involved. They were asked for help. They sent the famous runner 150 miles running to Sparta and back at high speed, Phaedipides his name was. And, um, and then he came with them to a battlefield, which was a fennel field. Marathon means a field of fennel. And that's why they called it, um, it's the Battle of Marathon. It's on the coast, um, the, the Persians, made some mistakes for some reason their horses were not present on the day whether they put them back on ships or they moved them off somewhere else we'll never know because the Greeks did very well and they the Spartans came a few um, days later and were absolutely mortified to have missed the battle completely and the Athenians were delighted because it was their victory alone but I mean the point about these things I suppose is that everyone who stood at that particular battle, then some of the, sorry, I should say the, the key figures who stood at that battle, Miltiades, um, gosh, uh, Aristides, Themistocles, uh, they all went on to dominate Athenian politics for the next 20 years. They were the generation that came to develop what we consider to be Athenian politics. And, um, and then of course, Xanthippus was there and his son was Pericles. And I thought if I'm gonna write the story of Pericles, that's what I'd like to do. 
I need to start with his father at Marathon because the first story arc is those guys coming back from the Battle of Marathon. And there's a man with them, Themistocles, who was extraordinary. I mean, he was a sort of tactical genius. And what he decided was that he would become the first man in Athens. And to do that, he had to get all the other key figures banished one by one, which he managed to do. I mean, it's a terrible thing that he arranged, but there was a system, an emergency sort of a pressure valve system where if you could just get 6,000 votes, anyone had to immediately leave the city and um, not come back for 10 years. And it was to stop tyrants. They'd had tyrants before. They'd had kings telling everyone what to do and they didn't want it. So the moment you started to become a little bit famous in a sort of Julius Caesar way, you found that there was a vote happening and they put um, ostracon, uh, little broken pieces of uh, pottery, which is from where we get the word ostracize. And we, they put that in, if they got, then they'd count them. And if they got 6,000, you were gone. And it didn't matter whether you had a wife and children or businesses or, or, or whatever else, or fame or power or armed men, you had to leave. And if you didn't leave, you were killed. So he managed to have all of his key competitors ostracized, banished in this way. And then, in 480 BC, having done this for 10 years and finally become the most famous sort of first man in Athens, Persia invades. The second part of the Persian invasion takes place and he has to ask them to come back because all of the great generals who were there at Marathon on that day have had, they've gone. They're living in other parts of Greece and he has to call them all back. And that's that's an incredible story. Uh, you know, it's, it's the reason I sort of uh, look for history for these great tales. It's the reason I do this sort of thing. Um, because I can just, you know, I can see his face. I can see how they would have come back because they loved Athens. They, they loved Greece. They didn't want it to be invaded and overrun. Athens was set on fire twice and burned to the ground by that Persian army. I mean, it was, it was an absolute fight for survival. Of course they came back, but oh my God, what a, what a tale, you know, what an extraordinary tale. That isn't where I was going to start either, I should say. I mean, uh, I, I'm, oh, I'm tempted because I was going to go on to this bit, which is the place I was actually going to start. I was just going to tell you a story, but um, I, sh I should. 25 minutes. I'll do this and then I'll ask for questions. So this, this, <laughs> this next bit. OK. Because <laughs> the thing is, I'm, uh, I'm looking for, uh, you know, stories from ancient Greece. Um, all the time and uh, you try and get into the culture as much as possible you try and what's idea um, everyone for example in this room will know of Elizabeth I will know who she was um, and we might know a bit about Sir Walter Raleigh and all the rest there, there's a, there are certain cultural touch points and if I'm writing about ancient Athens then I also need to know what they knew so that they can make references to it so when you read there's, there was a story in Herodotus which was about an Olympics which took place on the Peloponnese, the, the big island connected to the mainland of Greece by a, a small land bridge where the Spartans were and all the rest of them, um, and not the Athenians, they were on the mainland. And the Olympics were held on the Peloponnese every few years. And um, at the end of one Olympics, a man called Cleisthenes, who was a tyrant king, came to the to speak to the athletes and he said obviously you are the greatest you know in Greece the the most the tallest the strongest the the fastest the fittest you one of you would make a great husband for my daughter who will inherit the kingdom and I am an old man and you know you will be king of my small kingdom it's a place called Sishion it was in northern Peloponnese and um, they were and you can imagine the cheer that went up. Um, they had a, a series of contests, he, he told them, and whoever came out as number one um, would be the one who married his daughter. And he planned a year of constant trials and there were running races and there were, you know, they had to declaim poetry. It wasn't, and they had to sit with him and debate various subjects. It wasn't all about the physical. He had, they had to be suitable sons-in-law. And by the end of a year, one man called Hippocleides was by far the front runner. Everyone knew Hippocleides was it. He was, he was in, he was going to be marrying the daughter. And the, the final part of the sort of assessment, the, the father threw a great feast. He had um, bullocks slaughtered and all sorts of animals on the spit and, and a huge amount of alcohol. And Hippocleides, thinking he had it in the bag, started drinking very, very heavily indeed. And he became obscenely drunk. <laughs> and the thing is, there was music playing and towards the end of the evening, literally while the father was about to stand up and say, um, you know, my daughter will be marrying Hippocleides, Hippocleides started demonstrating the dances of his native uh, area of Greece. And he did one after the other. 
And he was with the crowd, of course, cheering and clapping him on to greater and greater excesses until his final, you know, uh, creme de <laughs> uh, greatest attempt was he went, he did a sort of headstand on a table and he was wearing a, a, a kilt with nothing underneath it. So when, as he did the headstand, obviously everything um, was revealed to the crowd. I mean, the Greeks are pretty relaxed about nudity, but this was, you know, at a sort of wedding feast. It was considered, and then and then part of the dance was to wave his legs back and forth in this way. So, <laughs> so it, it couldn't have been more revealing. And the father, the father was appalled at this breach in uh, good manners, and he stood up and said, "Hippocleides, you have danced away your inheritance." And Hippocleides said, in Greek, Uphrontis Hippocleides. That does not bother Hippocleides. Now, the point is that phrase, Uphrontis Hippocleides, it doesn't bother Hippocleides, became, I couldn't give a stuff. It, it means in, it was common in Athens that people would say, you know, oh my goodness, my house, my poor house has burned down. Well, you know what, Uphrontis Hippocleides. It, it doesn't bother Hippocleides. And it, it, it became so well known that um, T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, his house in Dorset has the words Uphrontis, which in English, if you were translating it idiomatically, would be something like no worries, um, if you don't put the Hippocleides bit on the end. So, so his house was called no worries, or his, his house, or no bother, or I'm not bothered, or something like that. And I asked my son to carve it mm -hmm. into a bit of wood, which he did. I'm, I don't know if you know, realize how proud I am that he actually did that. <laughs> and that's <laughs> Uphrontis. And it means no worries. And I'm going to sort of screw that to my, my wall outside my front door because I think that's a lovely thing. And if anyone would like to photograph that afterwards, by the way, I'm so proud of it. I thought I would bring it along for you to see. And that's a good story. That, that was in Herodotus. It's uh, over, it's two and a half thousand years old, or to be honest, it could be 3,000 years old. No one's exactly sure when Herodotus was writing. It could be three and a half. Um, so we're, we're talking about ancient stories that have survived that long because they're good. And I better stop there because really you need a chance to uh, actually ask a question. It's going to be a bit awkward now if you, after all that. I'll start. I'll start. I, um, where's all the documented evidence of these stories? Where do you get it all from? Some of them are the classic texts. I mean, uh, Herodotus has flaws. I think there's a whole bit where he talks about giant ants, um, giant golden ants. There are elements of, I can't call it fantasy, legend um, in the in the history, just as there are if you go back to British history, Geoffrey uh, Monmouth, um, he talks about giants and all the rest of it. Um, the, the idea of history as a record of events was really invented during this period by Thucydides. So we have books where he details um, the wars between Athens and Sparta in enormous detail. And then we have Herodotus where he's clearly telling stories. Um, when it comes to something like Julius Caesar, there are multiple sources and you, you have to make some decisions. So you read Suetonius, he, he did a life of uh, um, Caesar, but you also, um, you read Plutarch and Plutarch did a life of Brutus, where, for example, he said, um, some people say Brutus was of noble stock, but others, especially those who supported Julius Caesar, said that he was of common stock. And I thought... Okay, that's fine for you, Plutarch, but I need to actually make a decision here because I am going, you know, I'm going to present him as a character. So I went one way of common stock. I thought that would be more interesting, um, bearing in mind that uh, Plutarch didn't know and neither does anyone else. To some extent, you will always have to interpret and fill the gaps because there are gaps. I mean, when Julius Caesar was assassinated, the last thing he did was pull his toga over his head and cover his face while he was being stabbed. And no one knows why he did it because he died very, very shortly afterwards. So all you can do there is say, well, it's a gap of motivation. So uh, the character he was, why did he do it? It could have been fear, for example. He could have been terrified and wanted to hide away from them, but that doesn't fit the character. He was physically involved in battle in a number of different ways and it, it just doesn't make sense for him. It could have been contempt and I went with contempt that he wouldn't, you know, he fought and he broke the arm of one of them. He fought until he saw Brutus. And he must have thought when he saw his friend of many, many years that Brutus was going to be there to save him. And when he realized that Brutus had a knife, then the spirit went out of him. And it was then that he pulled the toga over his head. So I can assume that it was contempt and despair. Um, you know, that's a story from Suetonius. It's the only record of that event. Sometimes there is one single event and that's harder than when there are multiples because when there are multiples you get to choose between them but when there's only one you have to choose well it's either true or a lie or 
you're aware, um, Claudius, I think it was, whose wife said when he was going back to the Roman records, there are too many bloody hands on that already. Don't go back and revise it again because, you know, it, there was a temptation in history to go and change the story. I mean, for example, the Ides of March, all Julius Caesar's life, he was told, beware the Ides of March. It wasn't just once, it happened quite regularly in his life. Now, either you accept that people can tell the future with extraordinary accuracy, because he was killed on the Ides the 15th of March, uh, or you accept that someone later on added that into the story to, to make it uh, a more sort of legendary tale. And I suspect it was the, the, the latter, but it's not always easy to tell. So the answer, I suppose, is that you read everything you can. Um, some of it, if it's primary sources from the, the time, fantastic, but even Suetonius was writing a century after uh, Caesar, as he, although he had access to all of the Roman archives. Um, and then I'll read secondary books as well. I, I found a wonderful one, um, Christian Myers, Julius Caesar, where all of his learning and expertise of, you know, 40 years lecturing on Caesar went into that book and, and I happily sort of drank it all up and thought this is fantastic. Um, because it, it, it introduced me to the character. Um, I'll read everything I can and I'll go everywhere I can. So I went to Sparta, for example, knowing that the ruins were from a number of different periods so that it, I wasn't looking at the strict ruins of Sparta. I was looking mostly at sort of Elizabethan sort of period, 400, 300 year old ruins. Um, I mean, the theater and so on had been repaired, but I was looking at the mountains uh, that someone like Leonidas would have seen, that same bowl of mountains. So uh, the heat and the dryness and staring around uh, at that place was for me important. Um, you know, riding me even something daft like, you know, uh, when I went into an old lady's house in, in Mongolia and it was a little house in the middle of nowhere and it was, uh, you know, it was made of wicker and felt and uh, a, a gear, as they call it, or yurt, but they called it gears. And I would have thought that a little old lady in the middle of nowhere, suddenly approached by me, and I had a male driver with me at this point and a female guy, so the three of us, I thought she would have been maybe a little afraid, but she was absolutely delighted because she hadn't seen a human being in days. And it's really good luck to have a stranger appear at the door when you have just um, finished brewing her particular kind of uh, vodka, which she had. <laughs> she gave me a glass of the stuff and I thought, oh my God, there's an actual tumbler. And I thought if I drink this, I mean, I could, I could die. This is alcohol poisoning. <laughs> but it was, it was more like wine, to be perfectly honest, in terms of... Uh, in terms of strength, because I think they probably can't distill very easily from a, a private home. But it was uh, <laughs> that kind of thing, that kind of thing. It all goes grist to the mill. I, I found one man in the middle of nowhere and he was uh, he was there with his very young son. And the tendency is to walk straight into people's houses. There is no Englishman's home, Mrs. Castle routine. And the first time it happened when my guide walked straight into someone's house and you have to duck down because it means you're vulnerable coming in physically. If they want to defend it, they can because you're, you're right down like this. The first time I did, I thought, we're gonna get killed. You can't just walk in and he put food onto their stove and started cooking and I said, come on, you know, <laughs> we're actually gonna get killed. I don't think you can do this in the middle of nowhere but they were again so pleased to see another human being in that isolated sort of pockets of, of humanity that it was fantastic the only one that went slightly wrong and it didn't go badly wrong was a, a young man who had for some reason a length of about two feet of uh, measuring tape that clicks you know it's it's concave so you can go click 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 and he was click clicking that thing very very uncomfortably while he was staring at us and I sort of, you know, signal that uh, we, we really, we really need to get out because every, if, you know, if you're picking up any signals at all, he did not want us in the house and he was very unhappy we were there. So that's the one time we backed out and, uh, and, and disappeared. He also, he did have a rifle for what it's worth. I mean, they, you know, they're very good with a bow and arrow, but if they can get a rifle, they're also fantastic shots with that. Um, they're very interesting people. I like them um, because I'm six foot two. And they're all shorter than me. Um, when I walk through a city like Ulaanbaatar, if I'm spotted by any young man under the age of about 40, they drift across to test the, their courage, if you like, and they will smack into my shoulder, which was not a lot of fun at the time. But it was it was really interesting because they were testing, you know, the, the, this this guy we might maybe a little intimidated, so we'll just drift to and to show him his boss. It was fun. I mean, it was uh, it was an unusual culture. Um, to be involved in but I, I absolutely loved it and I loved them they were welcoming and fun and honestly even if every time you walked into a tent someone's home uh, you had to hold out your right hand and then cup your right elbow with your left hand so that you could not be carrying a weapon 
um, just to demonstrate it. And I thought, oh, well, that's just, you know, that's the lonely planet being silly or something like that. But then the, the, the only time I, did, I forgot and put, just put my hand out to shake someone's hand, there was a kind of collective gasp and they all pulled back and they pulled away in case I was about to attack with my left hand, which was fascinating. I mean, I, I was just fascinated by the, by the whole place. Um, so when it comes to sources, I just read everything I can and go to everywhere I can and then and fill the gaps as best I can. And the very oldest sources, uh, in what format is it? In what, in what language is it? Is it easy to read? Easy to I, read? Despite the uh, my delight in Euphrontis, I can't read uh, ancient Greek. My son, <laughs> my son can, so he's, he's quite useful. <laughs> Um, when I went to Sparta and Athens and all the rest of it, I mean, he was just useful to read road signs. Otherwise, I'd be there today. Um, <laughs> as it, that was a bit of a struggle. Um, th th you know, they're all reprinted uh, in, I won't say modern English exactly, slightly archaic usually. I go for the oldest I can. Um, but it'll be me reading it in English, I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> there are, yeah, there are limits to things I can do with that. Have you all got questions? Keita, you're always good for one. <laughs> um, so I read David Gemmell when I was right. growing up. I loved and I loved his Alexander and Dark Prince. Mm. Um, so, are there any other authors that you particularly admire? I mean, you also talked about Vernon Cornwall, but or any authors where you think I can do a better job than that? Uh, I don't know about a better job. I mean, you know, writing uh, is something I always wanted to do. I always wanted to tell stories, and I always read and enjoyed and discovered new authors without particularly thinking. I mean, I, I just wanted to do it. I wanted to. Um, I always tell stories. I mean, my, one of my earliest memories is me making things up to um, say to my brother sort of, you know, late at night and things like that. And then uh, there was a whole Dungeons and Dragons thing that I won't go into, but it was, uh, you know, it was at the end of the day, I was the dungeon master. So I was effectively writing a story for the, the people to follow a routine. And it was, it was all part of that urge. I, I mean, I like James Clavell. I read his Taipan, for example, Hornblower. I absolutely loved Hornblower as a character because it was basically my dad. Uh, my dad was good at mathematics and loved bridge and was pretty much tone deaf musically. And that, you know, so that was, and loved the sea and all the rest of it. So he, my dad effectively was Hornblower. Um, and I, 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 you know, you, you name it, historical fiction I picked up without really realizing I was reading a genre. I never, it never occurred to me. Um, when I was writing those books from the age of 11 onwards, I, I was happily writing thrillers and I, I did a kind of uh, expose of a, a group in the Catholic Church and it was just you know that was a terrible idea and it was very badly written and when I would send them off and get uh, it sent back I, I wouldn't get too upset about it because I enjoyed the process um, and I'd put it up and wrap it up in brown paper and string which I did a chapter on how to wrap things in brown paper and string for the Davis book for boys because I'd been doing it for goodness knows how long and stick them in the attic and, and mostly just forgot about them um, and I haven't had the need to sort of dig any out because I, I like to move on to new things. Uh, I mean, I'm always at, at the moment I'm doing a children's book, which I'm commissioned to write for a uh, for the um, the climate change conference in, in November, um, which is kind of interesting. And that's in verse. So it's something I've never tried to do before. It turns out to be a hell of a lot harder than I was expecting. Mm -hmm. Julia Donaldson, it turns out, is a genius. And I've no idea <laughs> how she makes it look as easy as she does. But it's really it was weird. trying to juggle rhyme and meter and move the story on at the same time. So you're doing three things. So change one word and everything's ruined. It's a heck of a lot harder, I think, than most people realize. So I was doing that. Um, I, I, I like coming up with new ideas and new stories and new genres. I did once say to Bernard Cornwall, I said something along the lines of, I can't, can you imagine writing about the same character over and over? And he gave me this funny look, which I didn't really realize at the time was because he'd spent so long writing sharp, but then he did move on to do his Arthurian stuff and all the rest of it. So I, I, I held myself responsible for that, which he won't appreciate at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably all wrong. I imagine the time is all wrong as well, but that's how I remember it. I, I, I just, uh, I don't know for particular periods. I wanted to avoid being uh, uh, just a Roman author. I mean, there's a huge amount of uh, material there. Uh, ben Kane used to have T-shirts made um, with uh, J A F R A. The the R A was no, I can't tell you what it stands for now. But the F is a very rude word. And the point is, mm -hmm. the rest of it was just another Roman author. But the point is, uh, you know, I didn't want to just be stuck in Rome the whole time, which is why I moved on to Genghis. And I, I look for stories because stories are the human condition. You know, history starts yesterday. It's everything we've ever done. It's uh, mostly things we want to remember that we're interested in and values. Um, so if you hear a story about something like the Spartan boy, which involves a very 
quickly a boy being told by his father he couldn't have a fox for a pet and then he has a fox for a pet anyway and he crosses the the yard of his house and the father comes out and says you know oh he's got the fox and he, he sees his father coming and shoves the fox under his coat so the father then clasps it very closely to him and the father's talking to him no idea what's going on and the fox starts to bite into him and scratch him and bite him and panics and starts to, to eat into him. And the, the, the boy is continuing to talk to his father and he uh, eventually falls dead because the fox has, has killed him. And the thing is the Spartans told that story and they told that story as an example of sort of the importance of obedience, um, you know, even to the point of death, they, they thought that those qualities were wonderfully admirable. I'm not sure whether it holds up today, to be to be perfectly honest, I think I'd want my son to say, oh, for God's sake, the fox is biting me. I mean, of course I would. <laughs> of course I would. Oh, no, I definitely would. Sorry, there's, 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 <laughs> no, come to think of it. No, there's absolutely no question. But I can, <laughs> but I can see the sort of tragedy of, uh, and I can see the fact that the Spartans uh, tell, give you give your values through the stories you tell. Um, you know, if we choose to tell a story about Scott of the Antarctic, even though he came second, um, I mean, he wasn't first to the South Pole. That's a story that we, you know, we talk about sort of uh, plucky endurance and his courage, uh, knowing he would die. And he wrote letters to all of the families of the other people. And he was the last one alive because their sleeping bags were knotted and his was left unknotted. So, you know, he was the last person. It, it's And he worried most. He wrote a letter to his wife saying, you know, I hope you keep your our son in the in the open air because it's good for a boy. And, you know, he, he had a lot of time when he was dying on his own. And that sort of thing inspires me. It makes it much harder to complain if I have some minor trivial physical ailment and I stub my toe or something, knowing what he went through. Th these are values as well as sheer entertainment, I think. That's always been my plan anyway. That's a good question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> good. Good the question. Do you mind if I ask how you find the stories in the first place? Um, well, I look for them. Um, I mean, like I said, the Xenophon thing came, the 10,000 came because uh, my son came across the story and he, he said, you should, you know, have a, a look at this. It's a great story. I mean, it was something as sort of simple as that. Um, and that's put me onto quite a few different, you know, then I, what I tend to do is if I can, I find one book um, that I can read about the, the sort of topic and see if it's going to fill, be filled with interesting things that, that get the old, you know, lights firing. And it, so far, I've been fairly lucky, I, I think. Um, I mean, Julius Caesar was, was a surprise to me and Genghis Khan was a surprise because it was such a good story, that, that story arc of, of poverty to most powerful man on earth. And uh, Wars of the Roses was, it was a different challenge. I do look for something new every time. I suppose I wouldn't just to, I mean, I was tempted to do different Roman emperors, you know, in that way, but I, I didn't want to. In fact, I deliberately made that difficult for myself. I, I, I got as far as Augustus and killed him off, um, I, you know, because I didn't want to. I, didn't, I wrote a kind of an epilogue part to his life. So it meant I couldn't go back and it was it was me stopping myself. You know, I also did a thing with Kublai Khan where having written the end of Genghis and found that, to be honest, quite upsetting because he was an impressive sort of ruthless devil. Um, I got to Kublai Khan and I got to the position where he was king of, uh, king, uh, emperor of China and he had a son and a, a wife and I knew he would get enormously fat so that he, he used to hunt with a leopard across his saddle because he couldn't go hunting himself and he would just send the leopard off and I knew his son would die before him and his wife would die before him and I knew all of his promise eventually, everyone, every, the thing about historical fiction is everyone has died. And so everyone has met their final tragedy and you can let that overshadow the entire life if you're not careful, as if it's a sort of Shakespearean awareness of tragedy coming. But I didn't want to because I liked Kublai Khan. He was a very, very impressive man. And I left him at the height of his youth and power because I didn't want to finish that particular story. Um, so, and then, you know, I move on and find others. It's never been a struggle to find good stories um, because honestly, you know, history, is absolutely filled with them um, because history is always about people and to be honest I think that the bad stories probably do get forgotten and the only things that really are retained are uh, the ones that we like the the stories that inspire us that give us certain values that we admire like courage but also just uh, the, the cracking good tales that have a surprise in them or, or something that you want some strange twist in the tale we, we all love that I mean that's the way human beings work we're the storytelling animal there is there is nothing else like us you know, in existence, we tell, I mean, I'm doing it now, 
there isn't there isn't a group of wolves you know on a hilltop somewhere with one wolf facing the other wolves and telling them about the amazing thing that happened it just doesn't exist i mean i know we t i know that's kind of obvious but we also just take it completely for granted that we pass on culture and values and interesting things that happened and funny things as well humor just by telling these daft stories and that's uh you know that's kind of wonderful i think i mean that's it's something i i like and admire any other questions at this point we're not doing too badly i could tell you mm -hmm. a, a story did just pop into my head while i was talking but go on yes um, but I loved your Royal Eurasian books. Oh, good. Um, but you told them from a completely different aspect to the one that we're all used to, which is it wasn't from the kings and it wasn't from the nobles. It was from the everyday man. What yeah. made you choose that storyline? I, um, in the past, I've usually, I mean, Bernard Cornwall, just to pick his example, just his sharp books, he didn't do Wellington's point of view. He did a, a minor rifleman's character, and that's how he chose to do it. And this is going to sound ridiculous now, but Shakespeare, on the other hand, cho chose he did Henry V. He didn't do Henry V's mate or Henry V, you know, his uh, spear carrier. He did the king's story himself. And although it sounds silly, I always prefer the Shakespearean way of doing things. Generally, I usually pick the Julius Caesar. I don't do Julius Caesar's cousin. Um, it's, I think it's because the stakes are so high that, it, you know, if Julius Caesar makes a mistake, you literally could lose thousands of lives instead of just you know one or one battle or whatever so i it instantly raises the stakes to a, a very high level but my problem with wars of the roses was the fact that i had this peculiar vacuum that henry the sixth was my lead character the king of england and he wasn't there i mean he physically wasn't no mentally wasn't present uh, for that period of time so i had to direct the story through other people and of course i mean we, we know um oh, i won't be able to remember his name now but elizabeth I had a spy master called Walsingham? No. Walsingham. Well, it was Walsingham, was it? Was it? Well, thank you. I hope I, was, I couldn't remember his name for a second. <laughs> so, rely on the Caroline. Today. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> we knew, um, and also a man called John D. Uh, for Elizabeth, and John D. If you're if you're interested, by the way, uh, was uh, also uh, a fan of arcane magic and uh, numerology. And when he wrote a letter to uh, Elizabeth I that was for her eyes only, he put the number, a particular number on it that would suggest it was from him and she only she would open it. Do you know what that number was? It was 007. Mm -hmm. that, that's that's true. And that's interesting. That's John Dee. But anyway, I knew that um, that's nothing to do with anyone I was talking about. The point is that I knew if a spy master existed, then there would have been a character, a spy master who existed for Henry VI because his marriage had to be brokered with a French princess. And the, the, someone came up with this extraordinary scheme of coming up with the only qualifying French princess in France at the time, who was not the main line, who could be brought over, but never allowed to meet the king before the day of his marriage, because they would have discovered immediately that he was sort of simple. And therefore he couldn't, it would have, the French would have been emboldened and so on and so on. So the whole idea of a character who could arrange that and broker that deal came about knowing that he existed, but if he was a decent spy master, then he wouldn't have appeared in the history books. So I came up with the idea of Derry Brewer. Um, also partly based on my son's football coach who took up uh, who took up cage fighting to see if he could do it. And it was <laughs> and he was genuinely he was very Martin, he was a very interesting man. Um, so in, in many ways uh, when Derry threatens to knock people out, that's because Martin threatened to knock me out one time <laughs> when I was annoying him. And this sort of thing, it, it all goes in. It's all it's all used in the end. <laughs> No, as far as I know, that wasn't really important to him. He just, <laughs> wanted, you know, he'd heard it as the gold standard, and he sort of of, of testing yourself. And you know, oh yeah, you you may think you're brave, mate, but you know, you haven't tried cage fighting. But then he could say, yes, I have, uh, <laughs> and it was it went fairly well. You know, that wasn't it was. He just wanted to be able to say he'd done. It was honestly genuinely. He is a genuinely interesting man. Um, but I will take aspects of character from all over because I want them to be as realistic as I possibly can. I want them to be like real people. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's an old thing to say, but real people are extraordinarily complex. It is, you can be sentenced for murder and the thing that's really bothering you is whether you look good in the suit at the very moment that your life is being decided because people are, they have layers upon layers upon layers and you cannot tell all of them. If you did, you'd be, you'd, you'd need a thousand pages and it wouldn't, we'll fall aside because Hilary Mantel is very good, but she does, you know, the, an extraordinary detail is her thing. But generally it isn't possible to be, to, uh, as complex as a real human being, you, you know, you're dealing with a, a different 
level of storytelling, but you do get to show what goes on in their head, which most of us can't see. And also you get to show other, how other people talk about them, which gives you a different sort of layer. So after a while you, get, you can get to know the characters very well indeed, I think. Um, but they'll always struggle to be as complicated as real people because real people are crazily uh, complicated. <laughs> Um, I mean, goodness knows what's going on behind your eyes as you're looking at me, or behind my eyes as I'm looking back at you. And we can, we've all got layers going on at the same time, the layers of consciousness. I mean, it's absolutely extraordinary. And uh, who knows, with the masks, you know, it, it changes the whole thing again. So who knows? Any other questions at this point? We've got 10 minutes. We're doing okay. Well, yeah. You talked earlier about, you know, going to different countries and hearing their, their stories. And, and obviously you've got your, your sort of little pack there. And is there anything else in sort of British and Irish history that you've, you've heard that maybe other countries don't know that you think, oh, I, I could write about that. Is there any others that have appealed to you? British and Irish history in particular. Um, I mean, I did write a book on Dunstan um, because he was an interesting man and he knew seven kings. And that was the, the thing, that was the fact that brought me in. Um, but it was pre-Norman invasion. He became the Archbishop of Canterbury. There were wonderful legends associated with him. And I wanted also to try just once to write a book in the first person because I, I do try to challenge myself in many ways. But that's the only thing that's appealed to me, I think, for a while. There, partly, I think, I do prefer ancient history and uh, to modern history. I remember when the, the um, Wilbur Smith books got into the modern era he did 10 Courtney books on the Courtney family and it was fantastic because uh, I knew the great grandfather better than the character in the sixth book did um, because I remembered his father his grandfather and his great grandfather and I remember their stories better than the man himself did because he'd never met them and you got to this wonderful bit where the richness came through generations but then um, he introduced Nelson Mandela as a young lawyer and I thought oh, Nelson Mandela is still alive at this point you cannot now have that character apparently in a fictional narrative but he's one of the key sort of you can't have him nip outside and kick a dog to death or something terrible because he didn't and he would the man himself would object and so I can sort of see I don't want to bring it too far into the modern age where the person himself might object or the person's son might object or something along those lines it just seemed like a, an unnecessary sort of struggle i prefer two and a half thousand years ago where you know you can you can write the story that and say look honestly this is the best i've done and there's no one to say it was my grandfather how dare you you know that that kind of thing would be uh would be a bit of a struggle i can't think of anything else off the top of my head that i've thought out of british history i mean the thing is i, I mean i did scott in the antarctic in the dangerous book for boys. I did um, Joe Simpson of Touching the Void uh, fame because that was an incredible story. His friend cutting the rope and letting him you know, plummet, thinking he was dead. I mean, my God, that, that's just, and he was kind enough, you know, to sort of let me use his story. It was a, a wonderful sort of thing. Um, these things do pop up, but it tends to be individuals and individual moments, uh, usually of courage that I find interesting rather than particular kings or queens or something like that. I, I have avoided the Tudors because it's such a well-trodden path that, and, and very well done. I mean, Philippa Gregory is a great writer um, and a wonderful woman. I always liked her. Um, we met, I should say, at a, oh, this is more gossip. We met, <laughs> oh, I'll tell you, we met at a, a sort of thing. We were going to Dublin and she was very nice. I, I got very drunk with her and all the rest of it. And it, was, and it was fairly good. And then I met her again at Hatchards. They have a, an author of the year thing. If you've been published during the year, they invite you for one day. And she was there, and I better not say who the other person was, because I, I, was, uh, I was chatting to her, and she was talking to a news presenter. And then Philip Gregory just disappeared. And I was stuck with the news presenter. And, the, and it, wasn't, it wasn't, the conversation was not going as well as I'd hoped. It was, I didn't know anything to ask her or to talk about. And it was going, it was a bit dull. And um, that's why I better not say her name, even by accident. So, and then it was fine, but I didn't see Philip Gregory again until about a year later. And I said, you know, what happened at, at Hatchards? You know, I was talking to you and she said, oh, well, unfortunately that person was stuck on transmit. And, uh, you know, I decided that I would go off. She said, just before she left, she said, oh, come, there's someone I must introduce you to. And then she came off. I said, but you said you were going to introduce someone to me. She said, yeah, that's my technique. If I get really stuck, <laughs> then I'll go off. And, and she never came back. And I thought, okay, she can. <laughs> she could see I was a little bit knocked by this whole situation. So she was fine and we patched it up. And then about a month later, yeah, no, two months later, I had an email and it was from a, a, a young Finnish poet. And he said, um, here are some of my work. And I started scrolling through it. 
and there were it was a thousand line after thousand line after that. I was scrolling through thinking, okay, and it was all very very dark. The Finns are wonderful people, but they are sometimes can be quite dark. And it was all about sort of you know the, the blackness of my soul and, and the mountains of my you know, and all this. I was kind of thinking, this is really odd. Why I've never met this person in my life. Why have they sent me this? How, how did they even get this email? I mean, this is, so I was going. It must have been honestly three, four thousand lines. It was a, an entire life's work, as far as I could tell. And I, I got to the, the very end. And it said, uh, and I had read it all. And it said, thank you for, you know, uh, reading this. I hope you've enjoyed it. Philippa Gregory said that you would. Because <laughs> <laughs> she's really clever. I mean, she really, you know, she, she knew she'd wound me up before and then decided to top that by, <laughs> by uh, honestly, it was... It was, she's a very funny woman. I mean, honestly, I had to, I thought, okay, that's great. I can't do things like that. I never can come up with anything like that. Um, anyway, no, I better not keep talking about that kind of thing. I used, when I was, oh, we've got no time for this now. Oh, I'll just tell you very quickly, when I was teaching, um, a friend of mine, there was another teacher, he used, he'd be brilliant at practical jokes. So I would leave the classroom, come in in the morning, all the tables would be stacked to the side and all the chairs would be duct taped together in a perfect circle facing outwards. So the very first thing I had to do was like, like it was a prayer meeting. It was really annoying. And he used to do this kind of thing to me all the time, but he left his duct tape behind one time. So I thought, brilliant. And I went up to his science lab and I duct taped his door completely shut. And what I forgot, I didn't realize that that particular science lab had a door that opened both ways. So then I couldn't leave it. So I knocked on it and he just walked up and went, rip. Yes, because I'd only prevented it opening out, but it didn't, you know, which I didn't, I didn't realise. So I still had the duct tape and I thought, okay, he's leaving. It was the end of term. And I thought what I'll do is I'll go find his car and I will just duct tape the thing. I've got no better imagination than this. I would just cover it in duct tape. And uh, I had a bit of trouble finding it because it wasn't in the, the school car park. But I thought, ah, he's clever because he's cunning. You know, he thinks of things. So he's parked it outside. So I went and I just duct taped the entire car. I mean, I, I wrapped it like a Christmas parcel in this thing. And then I came back in and I listened to his goodbye speeches and I was sort of sitting and amusing myself and thinking, this is brilliant, this is brilliant, he's going to love this. And then at the very end, uh, you know, he came out and says, it's really nice, and I said, I'm going off to my new job. And we shook hands and I said, by the way, is your car UP9BWB? And he said, no. <laughs> I thought, oh my God, I'm going to be arrested. I'm pretty sure that's criminal damage. So I ran out into the street and I, I very carefully unpicked all of the stuff. And I came in with this huge armful of uh, duct tape and he said, oh, no, hang on. Yes, UP9 BWV. <laughs> Honestly, he was a sort of twisted genius. His name was, no, that's Craig Dacuna. What the heck? He was a twisted genius. It did make me laugh at the time, but I've never been good at that kind of, oh my goodness. We've only got about a minute. Are there any other questions? What should, should we finish with that? I mean, I, I could finish. What are you that. working on next? Is always a classic. Isn't it? Well, I'm still on Pericles, um, the young Pericles, because uh, his story is extraordinary. I mean, at the age of 12, 13, he was evacuated from Athens because Persia was coming in and they could do nothing to stop that huge army. So they evacuated everyone to the island of Salamis, which is just off the port of Piraeus by Athens. And all the women and children and old men of uh, Athens sat there and watched their city being set on fire. It's only a few miles away. They would, you know, saw the smoke coming up and going from sort of that moment as a young boy and that destruction, then going back in and they're unable to stop the Persians returning and doing it again um, is a heck of a story. Um, he then grows up to be the greatest statesman of the age. And it's, it's how he handled the breakdown of relations with Athens between Athens and Sparta and the war that follows. Um, I mean, as always, these are you know real people and real stories, and it's it's what it's what I love to do. I probably did, better um, stop there. Did yes. your story uh, sort of coincide with Shakespeare's view of Pericles? Um, well, that's a bit awkward. I mean, I, I was an English teacher many years ago, but about the only Shakespeare play I've never read <laughs> is Pericles. So that's a you know <laughs> it's a tricky one. Funnily enough, and honestly, this this is true. Uh, when I wrote, uh, what was I doing? I was doing Julius Caesar, and then I wrote the uh, sort of moving on after Julius Caesar into uh, Octavian and the assassins and all the rest of it. And I was following the plot of Antony and Cleopatra, all, well, definitely without realizing it, because um, at that point, it, if I'd read it at all, it would have been many, many years before. It, discovering that I'd followed almost note for note, the plot of uh, a Shakespearean play was fine once. I'd hate to discover I've done it again with Pericles. Um, <laughs> but the man had a talent for finding great stories. Um, I mean, in, in many ways, I don't mind walking in his shoes as long as I do a half decent job of it you know that's that's all I ever ask really yeah good well thank you so much um
gone for a, a wonderful hour. I think it's more than an hour, actually, because I think we started five minutes uh, early. So uh, thank you, audience, for, for coming along. As a, as a guinea pig event, I think it's been a, a, a huge success, actually. So um, uh, here endeth the, the event. Obviously, we're going to do some signings now and stuff. So uh, I'll obviously stop the uh, recording. And uh, uh, yeah, just a quick round of applause for everyone.